Luke 7, 36 to 50. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm back uh, to work. I had a really nice vacation. It was really nice to uh, sit at home. Uh, I really couldn't go anywhere, uh, but the backyard was an absolute blessing. Uh, and other than the heat, uh, still, it was, it was lovely. I really want to thank um, uh, Paul Shaw and uh, Barb Sargent for uh, preaching while I was away, and also uh, Ed McLaughlin, who did the taping and the editing so that that could be uploaded. It really was a gift to me. It was nice Nice to get away and have no responsibilities, but uh, I'm back now. And uh, even though we continue in this COVID way through video, I continue my series 2020 Vision. Uh, pick it up now. Uh, as I've said to you before, that this uh, title, uh, 2020 Vision, is certainly tongue in cheek, and it's meant to be that way. Uh, this is a term, 2020 vision is a term that we use uh, to um, uh, denote clear or sharp vision. And of course, uh, the year 2020 has been anything but clear. And even though a month has gone by and some situations seem to be getting better, others not, uh, we still have a fair amount of uncertainty. You know, we still have questions about education and about uh, how our, our uh, social circles expand or not, or whether we can meet, uh, larger groups can meet. All of that still is really, you know, it's working itself out, uh, but we are still, uh, again, it's still fairly an unclear uh, horizon at the moment. And uh, this series, uh, to remind you, is, is simply not to just remind ourselves of, of the, the uncertainty of the times, but, but also as a reminder as Christians that uh, we, we are to respond to the times regardless of what they are. And so given our circumstances, how do we respond? How do we live in this? And in particular... Uh, in the midst of the, the, the polarization that uh, I have talked about previously, you know, the, the world is really at, at each other, ends of, you know, different ends of the spectrum in terms of politics and religion and society. People are really bashing it out. There's a lot of bickering, uh, and particularly in social media. My gosh, it's, it's sometimes it's not, it's just not even worth to wade in at all. And, and I was thinking, uh, and, and I, I know that you are too, you know, like, what, why, why have we always been so argumentative? And, and maybe we have, but I think this is really has brought out, uh, a lot of anger and, and acrimony, uh, between people. It should, you, you would think it would be a time that we, we do pull together and we live together. And, and many people are. I, I am thankful for that. People are trying to cooperate. They're trying to, you know, people are trying to live by the rules and by the restrictions and all that sort of stuff. But nonetheless, there is, you would know, uh, you watch the news, you get on social media that there is a fair amount of acrimony out there. And the question is why? Why is that? In particular, I'm asking it for Christians, because we are not immune to this uh, anger and, and bickering that is going on. I'm going to make a bold statement, and the only reason I can make it is that it applies to me as well. I think the reason, uh, or one of the reasons, I don't want to be simplistic, but one of the reasons that there is so much bickering, and, and I will take issue with, uh, with Christians in particular, um, and that includes me, uh, is that... Uh, too many people do not know or feel or experience the love of God personally, okay? Um, I'm not saying theologically or abstractly that they have not accepted or understood or felt the love of God personally, because that makes a huge difference in the way that we look at the world. It affects how we live and how we respond to all the circumstances that come our way. Because we have no control over what the world is going to throw at us. Um, so we have to live in it, respond to it. And so why why the anger, animosity, the, the acrimony uh, that we see? Uh, a reason why I chose this particular scripture today, as I said, I, the reason being the reason that people, I think, are added uh, uh, at each other is that they don't feel the love of God. They haven't absorbed it. They haven't experienced it. And I know that sounds high and mighty, um, but I, it's just an honest appraisal of what I think is happening. 
That's why I chose this gospel account. Um, and it's, you know, one of the, I mean, it's a classic in many ways, one of the stories of Jesus being anointed uh, by a woman. And in this particular telling, and uh, most biblical authorities think that this is a story that happened within itself. It's not related to the other, uh, potentially other anointing stories. But regardless, uh, Jesus is at the house of uh, a Pharisee. His name is Simon. He's there for supper. And uh, as you can well imagine, uh, it, it was very proper, uh, in, uh, maybe painfully so. Have you ever been to places where uh, people are so full of themselves or so stuck up that you know you don't you think you're walking on eggshells? Um, I, I'm I'm pretty sure. Well, Jesus knew what he was getting into, uh, and yet he went. Bless his heart. Like it, an amazing thing, he wasn't going to just say to Simon, "No, I'm not going to your place. You you're a mess." Well, he's in this very proper established, you know, very proper atmosphere. And there's very likely also uh, many guests and onlookers. Uh, a, a meal like this in the culture of Jesus's day would have attracted uh, some degree of, of an audience as well as the guests. And it says that a woman who led, led a sinful life came into the room right off the bat. That's just a no-no in the culture of the day. The woman intruding into the men's world was to begin with somewhat suspect, but she's known to be uh, a sinner. Mm, praise the Lord. You know, we, we, we just, we just love to label people sinners. It's a beautiful thing. She comes in and without any, uh, any warning or whatever, she, she is crying so hard, uh, that she, absolutely wets Jesus with her, his, his feet with her tears and she's washing his feet with her tears and then, uh, dries his, uh, his feet with her hair and anoints him. She brought him, uh, uh, perfume with him. So she had planned what she was doing. She, she knew what she wanted to do. Uh, she's so overwhelmed though that she cries so hard that she absolutely soaks Jesus's feet not your usual dinner polite uh, situation, wouldn't you say? I mean, most of us would be kind of like taken aback and think, whoa, what's going on here? Uh, but Simon is not happy. He's not happy with this situation. This lady's come in and she is a mess and she's messed things up. I'm not so sure he was, he didn't, he really cared about Jesus himself. They were often trying to trap him into saying things or study him so that they could use it later. But regardless, he, he is probably truly shocked by what is happening around and and uh he he's thinking to himself well you know what jesus can't be a prophet if he doesn't know what this lady's like you know he wouldn't allow that to happen if he was a prophet well jesus being jesus uh he knows what he's thinking and he poses the question that i read to you in the scripture today he he gives this short little story of two people that owed money 500 uh denarii and 500 denarii and they're both forgiven. And he asks uh, the Pharisee, you know, who who was loved more? And the Pharisee answers correctly, right? Who, uh, obviously, the guy who had owed more money uh, probably loved more. And uh, again, he he knew the answer. He he, academically, philosophically, abstractly, he was correct. Uh, Jesus uses though that answer to say, you know what? When I came into your house, you didn't wash my feet, but she's been, she bathed my feet with her tears. You, you know, you didn't give me a kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. Uh, you didn't anoint me, my head with oil as a, a gracious host would do, but this lady has, uh, anointed me with her perfume. And, and then he goes and, and he says to her, your sins are forgiven, which uh, that's absolutely scandalizes everyone in the room. Uh, now, I want to acknowledge something about this story, all right, or, or uh, because I'm going in a particular direction here. I want to acknowledge that there is a lot of depth, spiritual depth in this particular story, which I'm not going to particularly touch on today. Um, uh, talking about the attitudes in the room, the religious attitudes of the people of who was in and who was out, who was considered worthy to come before God. There's also a lot to say about religious hypocrisy, and I've said enough about that, and I'm, I'm, you know, guilty of that m myself. Uh, so there's a lot we could say about religious hypocrisy. And we could also, I could also spend time to talk about, uh, Jesus' authority to forgive sin as, as the Son of God, the Messiah, uh, God, uh, incarnate. 
Um, all of those are very good um, topics and meanings to pull out of this story. Um, but for today, uh, I want to go just in one small aspect of this. For today, given our world, the way that we bicker, the way that we are polarized, the way we can't seem to see people eye to eye right now, I want to focus simply on how Jesus made that woman feel. Because I think that's really important to what we're experiencing today. He made her feel very different than the other people in that room and potentially even the audience that was crowding in to see uh, this meal between this, quote, Messiah and Simon, a Pharisee. We know that uh, people knew, at least Simon did, and probably other people did too, that this woman led a sinful life. So her peers, the people that are around her, would have probably been tis tisking the minute she walked into the room. Um, and Simon is truly taken aback. You know what? And to give him some credit, if I was in a situation, I might be all huffy too. Uh, it was shocking for sure. Okay? I mean, uh, we live in our century, but even then, uh, well, I was going to say in that culture, the women were secondary in many ways to the men, at least in public uh, arenas. Um, I would, we could argue that we've come a long way since then, but in some ways we have it. Uh, it's still a man's world in too many places. Um, so for one thing, uh, just to give him his due, culturally, he might have been shocked by what was happening. And then there was, you know, the whole thing about t touching a bare feet, skin, that was, that was a bit scandalous. Um, whether we like it or not, uh, a woman who put her, down her hair uh, was considered uh, not um, uh, the nicest of persons. And so there were, in this, there were scandalous and even sexual overtones. I, I know that sounds wacky as I'll get out. It's just that to Simon, it would have looked like really, really bad. And so he, he just, well, he's dismissed her. She's a, you know, if, if Jesus knew that this, what, what she does, he, he, he's thinking he, he wouldn't even pay attention to her. So he's dismissed her. But by seeing all of this, he's absolutely dismissed her in his mind. And, uh, that's, that's done with. She, she should be out of the way. But notice. Jesus sees the exact same thing. In fact, he's the center of that activity. He sees the same thing, and yet he's not alarmed, and he's not scandalized. Think about that for a second. One person says, whoa, holy mackerel. That lady's, that lady's just gone. That's just crazy. And Jesus actually soaks it in. He's really not saying anything either. He just, he's interacting with the woman. I love that about him. And the reason, and I've, I've said this umpteen times to you, I, I hope it doesn't sound like I repeat myself to you, but uh, Jesus sees a person, not a reputation. And boy, am I guilty of doing the latter and in, in seeing a reputation. Uh, I, 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 I'll just launch into a, a description of someone and realize I, I'm, I'm just labeling that person instead of seeing them as a person first. And I love that Jesus uh, is, I get, like I said, not scandalized or put off one bit by what is happening around him, uh, what this woman is doing in front of him, in front of him. He, he he has a default setting, which is love. It's really beautiful, right? Whatever our default setting, that's that's what triggers us. That's that's what guides us. That's what makes us respond in a certain way. Is our default settings the ones that sometimes we don't challenge, we don't try to change, we don't. Sometimes we're not even aware of them, but we have default settings that that dictate the way we live and react. And his is one of love, of tolerance, of observation, too, of, of opening up and listening to the person, uh, it, taking in what is happening instead of reacting. And so, again, his, his default setting is love. And this woman 
feels it. She knows it. Why else would she have had the nerve to do what she did, given the circumstances and the culture of her day, her reputation? That could be actually, uh, could be a dangerous situation too, because if people took the law into their own hands, uh, they, they, they could hurt her. But she had the courage and, and in, I would think in some ways, the certain knowledge that Jesus saw her in a different way. Now, we don't know whether they interacted before. We don't know. We just know the story that is happening there. She is prepared. Like she knows that somehow she can get to Jesus and, and thank him, love him. And she's prepared for it. She, she has this bottle of perfume that she's taking with her. It's, it's such a neat thing. She has the courage to brave the stares of all the men at the table and, and likely the spectators too. As I said, this would have been to some degree a communal experience that there would have been people who would have gathered to observe this important meal between a prophet and a, a Pharisee, a member of the religious class. She would have had, I don't know whether to call it the certainty or the, the hope that she could press through the shame that she felt about herself or that she felt others on, you know, pouring onto her. Um, and be able to just work through that. And, and regardless of what people were thinking, uh, personally or as a group of people, she would have been able to go up to Jesus and do, uh, what she did. As, as, as the scriptures say, she, she wept so, so tremendously that she, she bathed Jesus' feet and dried them with her hair. It's not the, it's almost clumsy in a way, if you think about it. You know, when you cry so hard and you're wiping your nose and you don't know whether you're coming or going and you're hiccuping. I, I'm not a good crier, let me tell you. I just look like a mess when I do it. And so it's not always pretty. She does all this and, 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 and yet she, she feels that Jesus would allow it. You imagine how beautiful that is. In the company she felt somehow, whether she had met him before or had seen him or knew of his reputation, whatever it is, she knew that she would be safe in his company, that she would be without shame, shameless, as I call this, uh, this particular message, shameless, but in every good sense of the word, right? Because we often say shameless as in something really bad. But in this one, I want you to, I want to catch your attention to say shameless, that this is, is good, that it's good, that she is shameless before Jesus Christ. And I've heard the discussions people have, well, you know, maybe she met him before and she's already, you know, maybe she's already been forgiven, regardless, even though Jesus says she's forgiven there, uh, and that she's repented and that's why Jesus treated her that way. You know what? <laughs> the story really doesn't tell us that. And actually, let me get you, let me tell you, I don't really care about the chronology of who said what or when it was done. I just love the fact that the lady, the woman, felt safe and valued, actually, enough to be listened to, to be, uh, you know, have her tears soak Jesus' feet. She felt self and valued to be able to do that. I mean, in the presence of all the other people, there was enough, there was enough love there was enough authority, there was enough power in Jesus to stay all the meanness around her, all the judgment. And I don't know what she did. I don't know. All I know is the bare bones part of this story, that even though Simon was scandalized, Jesus was not. Took it all in. Actually said, yeah, you know, your, your sins are forgiven. But like I said earlier, 
And this is important for the world that we live in. And I'm guilty of this. My gosh, sometimes I just think, why on earth do I just say what I say sometimes? Just, just relax. I said earlier that Jesus saw her, the person, the soul, the heart, not her reputation, not what she had done, not what everyone considered herself to do, had been doing that uh, put her in, in uh, such negative light that Simon would say, this guy's not a prophet if he just knew what this lady has done or has been doing. No, I, I repeat myself, but it's important, okay? I, really, I want you to, this is, this is simply the application and I'm not gonna go on about it. The application is, and I, I have to take it to task, you know I mean, to heart too. Jesus saw her, not her reputation. It's not that Jesus can't change us, not that Jesus won't challenge us, Jesus won't ask us to stop doing what we're doing, but he saw her first. Hmm. As I said, love was his default setting. Praise God. Really and truly, thank you, Jesus, for having that spirit to see beyond the things that we do that sometimes might be shameful and things we would wish we could have not done or hide. And yet he sees us with love, sees us. That's his default setting. So let me ask you a question and going to leave it at that. Just like Jesus asked Simon a question. Jesus's default setting is love. What is yours? What is your default setting? I asked that to myself. What is my default setting? Do you, do I, do we see people first through love? Or do we see a reputation? In this bickering world, I would say too many people see reputations. And that's all they, as far as they're going to go. They're not going to go any farther than that. Let me ask again. What is yours? What is my? What is our default setting? It's a very simple question. Uh, really, we could answer it fairly easily. And the answer has huge implications for how we live, how we respond to things, how we handle the things that come our way, which we don't often have control of it. It has big, big implications. I'm going to leave it there. And we're going to listen to a hymn. And I'm going to come back and we're going to pray. And it's good to be back, even though I, I miss you all. I miss seeing your faces. I miss hearing your voices and sharing our stories. Ah, but you know what? It's going to come eventually. I don't know when, but it's it's going to come. But I do miss you. And it is good to be back, even if it is through this medium of video. And I hope, I, I really do hope that you've had a good month so far. Uh, and um, that um, you're, you're, you know, ready to, to engage with the things that are going to be happening and how, how society is going to take its, uh, you know, what we're going to do. But anyway, it's good to be reminded, uh, too, that we're all in this uh, as a family of God. And so uh, let's listen to a hymn. I invite you to sing along if you care to, and then I'll be back and I will pray with you. Okay? Uh, be right back.
Well, love divine, uh, love's excelling. We can, I mean, it's a wonderful hymn. I hope it's uh, one of the ones that uh, you enjoy. Uh, but just think of that, uh, that this, this has, it sounds so pretty, uh, love divine, all loves excelling. And yet it is meant to be so practically and life-changingly true that with God's love guiding us, uh, we respond in a very different way uh, to the world and the people around us. But I'm not going to preach again. Not, aren't you happy? Uh, I'm just going to pray with you, and uh, uh, let's let's do that. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your love. Uh, certainly, you challenge us. Certainly, you do not let us just stay where we are unless we choose so. Certainly, you don't let us uh, get away without uh, analyzing our life and um, uh, comparing it to uh, the life that it should be with you uh, at the head. But we thank you, Lord God, that no matter what, you look at us with love and with uh, kindness, with uh, patience, with compassion, with forgiveness. I pray that uh, all of us would be able to, to feel that in one way or another. Uh, I pray that we would be an example to each other because sometimes this can be just academic stuff that we listen to until we bump up against someone who truly shows your love and then we really are kind of jarred by it. And so I pray that each and every one of us could be an example uh, to uh, to the people around us. Lord God, that we would know that love is so powerful and that it strips away all the misery uh, of, of being judged and unwanted. Lord, help us to live that way in our minds and in our, uh, in our actions, that, that every part of us pulsates with the sense that you love us and that we are, we are, we mean something to you, that you love us, that, that we are worthy. And that then we can react and act in the same way to the people around us. May it be that if today, Lord God, or in the week to come, we find someone, we bump up against someone that needs to be reminded of your love, that we don't do it by uh, pontificating, but by being loving to them, by being conscious of their situation, of, of not dismissing them. Whatever it is, Lord God, help us then. Uh, and if it is ourselves, Lord God, I pray that if... If there is anyone out there uh, who is listening to this or watching this today, I pray, Lord God, that they would uh, know that they can call me. Not that I'm an expert, but I, I'm, I'm the minister here. It's just one of the roles that I, I play. Lord God, that they would be able to call, email me, and and schedule even just a chat over the phone uh, to to be reminded that you do indeed love them, that it isn't strange at all, that it is the root of our our faith. Lord God, help help us then to, to be love and to feel your love. And may it be that in every way it affects what we uh, say and do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, good people. Uh, I will be uh, contacting everybody too. Uh, not everybody, but everyone that's on my uh, uh, list, uh, my pastoral care list. And I'll be starting a little bit more emails to the congregation. Uh, just a reminder too that um, if you know of someone uh, that in the last month their situation has changed, that I haven't, part haven't for uh, whatever reason maybe not have heard about it, uh, Sue Eason is very good in letting me know uh, of the situations that are developing in, your, in the lives of the people. But if you if you uh, know of something, please let me know because I will be starting to uh, make phone calls again. And uh, if it is at all possible, I will be starting to schedule uh, meetings with people using uh, uh, distancing and all the proper protocols. So uh, let's just say I'm, I'm back in the office. And uh, if there is any way that I can help in a specific way, uh, please let me know. So in the meantime, and for this week, I wish you God's blessings. Uh, see you very soon.